But I'm just going to talk a little bit about the company that I work for that, that Mark mentioned in my bio and some of the things that they encountered. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you, I worked with a group of people in that company that were innovative, that never got scared, that were able to pivot on a dime. And there are so many things that those folks taught me during those years that I think can apply to the conversation that we're going to have here over the next day and a half. So just to share some stories from the history of the Andersons, I'll tell you a little bit more about that company. It's a large agribusiness and uh, about a billion dollar market cap, um, headquartered in suburban Toledo. Um, their primary businesses are grain merchandising was their flagship business. They, they buy and sell fertilizer and, uh, um, and not just for uh, farms, but also they have a, a big golf course tur turf business. They lease rail cars and, and they... Uh, repair rail cars, and then they also had do ethanol, which I'll tell a little story about that. But uh, um, how did this company do so well at staying relevant at so many moments when they really should have died and folded up? And, and maybe we can start talking about how we react to this change by some of those stories that I can tell you. First of all, the post-war boom. I'm talking about right after World War II. I'm talking about the late 40s all the way through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, I wasn't there for most of this, obviously, I would, not for any of it, actually, but I had the pleasure to meet a lot of the company founders' sons, grandsons, granddaughters that did run the company, and a lot of the key employees that were there at the time and learn from how they reacted to these situations. So the post-war post boom, what happened? Um, obviously, they were rebuilding Europe, right? And so they were positioned at the perfect point at the exit of the Great Lakes to load grain out of the eastern Corn Belt to feed Russia, to feed Germany, to feed the European areas that were rebuilding after the, after the war. And Harold Anderson, the company founder, originally conceived the idea of the grain terminal. So in other words, the Midwest was speckled with tiny little grain elevators, and he was the first idea to concentrate space and loading capacity into one spot right at the mouth of Lake Erie and start loading big ships of grain that would go to, uh, to Europe at the time. And uh, obviously something that is universal throughout the globe now. What happened next? The embargo. There's a few gray hairs in the room. Some of them won't remember this, but Jimmy Carter in 1979 embargoes grain to, uh, to Russia. And I've just told you a little bit of the history of the company. So if you knew enough about what I just told you, then you know that that should have been the death knell of the company. It should have taken them down, should have destroyed them. What they did at the time was to say, okay, we've got to pivot. We've got to pivot. It's not about the change, it's about our reaction to the change. So what did they do? They had took their entire inland infrastructure and, and went from configuring it to export to finding out that they were consolidating all the hog and poultry manufacturer processors and, and feeders in, in South Carolina, in Georgia, in the Delmarva Peninsula, and, and reconfigured their entire infrastructure that was used to be configured to, to feeding exports off the East Coast to then feeding those chickens and hogs in the East and completely rebuilt the company off of that disaster. After that came an 88 drought. Again, if you're in Wyoming, that probably doesn't mean anything to you, but if you meet a farmer in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Iowa, they remember that drought. It's, it's, I was in high school, or college at the time. It's still burned in my memory how bad our crops looked out east during that. It almost took the company down again. Volumes collapsed. They had grain contracts that farmers couldn't honor. What did they do? About the time I came in the grain business, they had completely reconfigured how they bought grain from farmers. They started offering flexible grain contracts where farmers could use option features to attach them. If you're in farming or in the grain business, you know the terms like delayed price or flexible contracts. They started innovating all those concepts that now Cargill took and ran with, ADM took and ran with. Uh, the Andersons was the first company to do that, and it was all a response to the 88 drought and how they were going to survive that, innovate it, and do something in a new way. Um, the biofuels boom, and this is one that I was right in the center with. I had a, a chance to talk to my table a little bit uh, about that experience. It was absolutely incredible. But um, people know the Andersons now in the East as a company that operates three or four ethanol plants. Four. At that time, they owned a bunch of grain terminal elevators, and if you can imagine it, these terminal elevators are positioned in the corn belt, and the ethanol plants are getting built in the corn belt. All of a sudden, you don't need the terminal elevators anymore, right? again, should have taken the company down. Our initial reaction was to say, okay, where's our, what can we do here? We're going to partner up with some of these ethanol plants and, and uh, 
uh, originate grain for them. That's, that's just what we'll do. But over time, we said, we're not going to be able to do it right, partnering up with anybody but ourselves. Why can't we build our own ethanol plants? And so what they did, and I'll tell a little bit more detail, and this is a second because it's telling, but to again take the terminal elevators that got reconfigured after the exports went away, reconfigure them again um, to produce ethanol. Most recently, the margin collapse. So 2008 to 2013, a wonderful time for a crop, row crop far farmer in the Midwest. You're making a lot of money, high commodity prices. Uh, but if you're in grain merchandising, there's not a lot of value in owning space and transportation and receiving. Um, so, and when, when the stocks got rebuilt in 2009, 10, 11, the margins never came back. So how did we react at that point in time? Well, we're going to talk a lot about, in the next day and a half, about specialty grains, right? The non-GMOs, the lentil beans, the ancient grains, the, the oats. Why couldn't we take our origination's ability and buy all the corn for Frito-Lay North America? We actually can, and we did. Why can't we take all of our grain origination's ability and buy all the oats for Quaker? We could, and we did. And then we started uh, um, grabbing small Plains-oriented um, small facilities uh, in the Canadian prairies and started reconfiguring those to take small specialty grains and take them into the non-GMO markets, into the other markets, and make them work for the marketplace that was developing in the future. So it's all about the response, right? We've got change, and then how do we respond? 